I'm going to share my screen here uh, because uh, I wrote a 30 page uh, paper uh, that some of you may have read, uh, but uh, uh, I can't read that. And uh, what I wanted to do was just kind of highlight some major points. I, I thank my colleagues at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for interaction along the way on this paper. And uh, I think they helped me a lot with regard to thinking about this more carefully. So uh, I wanna begin by just, uh, I did begin in the paper and I wanna begin here by highlighting that uh, this has been a long journey for me in terms of um, my involvement in this discussion for a long time. I was a young earth creation biblical scholar. I taught with Jack Whitcomb at Grace Theological Seminary and uh, studied under him previously. So there, there's a lot of connection there, but I came to a certain point as I was working on this and studying the Bible that I realized that, uh, uh, let's see, I'm getting my time written down here. Uh, I came to the realization that uh, I think I was having trouble reading the text that way. Uh, my discussion, my, my engagement with this has not come out of challenges from science. It's kind of come out of challenges from the Bible itself. And uh, yet the scientific discussion has stimulated me to think about the Bible, uh, but it has not been determinative in any way. One of the things that stood out to me early on uh, was the, the use, let me get, get this going here, okay, of uh, the six, seven pattern. And uh, the fact that it was used in Genesis one was uh, to me, uh, possibly an indicator that this was a schematized account that uh, to, take, to take it uh, literalistically would be wrong. Of course, it is literal. There are, it is using literal days uh, in the context, evening and morning and so on, but it's using them in a literary way to create a six, seven pattern. And there's lots of passages. Proverbs six is a completely different genre in which the same thing is used. It's used in all sorts of different genres. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And you go through them and you come out uh, and one who stirs up dissension among brothers is what this all adds up to. So the, the point is that uh, these kinds of things caught my attention uh, early on, and I became aware that uh, I needed to rethink this whole thing. Uh, now, uh, the problem was, as a young earth creationist, there were other things that, that bothered me, and that was the uh, vapor canopy theory, that uh, there was this vapor canopy around the earth that... Uh, early on, uh, and this created the context. This is a big part of con connection with flood geology and so on. And uh, that was supposed to be uh, come out of day two in Genesis chapter one, uh, the, the, the waters above and below. The problem, of course, is that this is very observational. That they, they knew that there was water up there because sometimes it fell down. Uh, they knew that it didn't rain unless there were clouds in the sky. They knew what the clouds were. They knew these things. They were observers of nature. And so I had a hard time believing they were thinking about uh, this uh, big body of water up there and the body of water down here in some kind of way that would lead to a canopy theory. What I found out oh, 15 years later or so was that uh, the uh, recent creationists, the young earth creationists had done the science on this and found out themselves uh, that this would not be scientifically feasible because if there was such a vapor canopy, the temperature on the earth would get up to like 700 degrees. And so uh, they themselves found this to be problematic. And more, more recently, there's been publications that reflect this concern amongst young earth creationists. I do not see myself as an anti-young earth creationist, I would be glad to find that, that that really is the answer, but I don't think that's what the text is talking about. And uh, I don't think that's what it's going after. This was one misreading of the text that I also saw as being problematic back in those days. And 
quite frankly, got in a lot of trouble <laughs> over this. Uh, then uh, there's other misreadings of these texts and specifically of day two and other things related to it. This common image that's found about the ancient, supposedly ancient mythological belief of the waters above and the sluices in the sky where the water rain would fall through and so on and so forth. There are so many things wrong with this picture that it's almost unbelievable that it even came up. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, so the, the problem is that, uh, uh, and even um, Othmar Kiel and others today are saying this is not what's going on. These are literary things and we need to keep them and understand them as literary. When it talks about the fountains of the great deep broke up, the floodwaters came down from the sky and so on. Uh, it's talking about the imp imposition of the macrocosm on the world of humanity, the microcosm. Uh, and so this is a mythological kind of built off of mythology, which is really literary, even in the ancient years. I don't think even the ancient Near Easterners believed this. They knew that, you know, the clouds, the waters sometimes cover up the stars, you know what I mean? And things like this. Uh, and uh, even in Genesis 4, according to that, the stars and the sun, they're embedded in the firmament. Well, uh, we know they move separately. So there's all sorts of problems with this kind of thing. So you can misread this text scientifically from a young earth point of view, you can mis misread it mythologically. I think there's a lot of misreading that's been going on. And uh, to read it in these kind of ways creates arguments between evolution uh, or and old earth and the biblical text itself that really don't exist in reality. That's, I think, a whole problem. The, so this discussion has, has developed in such a way that, uh, um, at a certain point, I kind of gave up on it uh, and just kind of stepped out of it for 15, 20 years because uh, it was just a lot of heat and no light in the discussion. It was going nowhere fast. And so uh, one of the things that has helped me is to just step on into this. I think I'll come back to this later. Uh, is uh, when Josh uh, Swamidas um, uh, his book came out, I was involved in some of the discussions leading up to it and so on. I found this to be a truly fascinating uh, book. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to say before getting into that is that uh, Meyer Sternberg, a, a great scholar of biblical narrative wrote this about the Bible. And this is overridden so many different ways in the discussion that I'm concerned about just how we're reading the Bible. He wrote, the Bible is difficult to read, easy to underread and overread and even misread, but virtually impossible to, so to speak, counterread unless one intentionally reads it in bad faith, as some are determined to do in the academy or other places, where the agenda is brought to the text rather than gained from it. The essentials are made transparent to all comers, the storyline, the word order, the value system. And I think that's just basically true that there are certain ways in which the Bible is really clear and we shouldn't be come bringing our agenda, but let the Bible give us the agenda that he is at in reading the Bible. Now, uh, Josh, in, in Joshua Swamidas, uh, in his discussion, he makes remarks like this. Evolution may have fractured the story of Adam and Eve, but we can recover it now. From a scientific point of view, all that is required is people outside the garden with whom Adam and Eve's offspring eventually interbreed. This has been mentioned in the other presentations. Um, and uh, there are some uh, problems with this uh, point of view, but I must say, I have found his discussion to be really helpful in this regard. It pushes back against the common overreach of evolutionary science against the possibility of an historical Adam and Eve at the headwaters of humanity. And uh, this has been a relief from some, some writers who have kind of smothered, tried to smother discussion and argue there's no way that this can be, uh, have any reality to it, uh, this historical Adam and Eve. And I think that's just 
uh, been incorrect from the beginning. And so it's important to keep that in mind uh, as, as one of the things that Josh's book, I think is very helpful to us. One of the problems though, is this uh, people outside the garden. In, uh, in the book, he talks about some hints that he thinks might suggest that the Bible does refer to these people outside the garden uh, before Adam and Eve. And he brings in with it uh, the question of Genesis 4 and uh, Cain and his wife and the people who might kill Cain. That's what he becomes afraid of. Uh, well, th this has been um, uh, answered by commentators uh, in the past and up to, to the present day by referring to the other children of Adam and Eve. We don't know how old Cain and Abel were at the time, according to the account, when uh, Cain killed Abel, but it, it's very possible the po population had already expanded quite extensively. And this is in the context of kinship vengeance as well. You know, Cain, Cain is afraid of vengeance. Well, vengeance happens from family members of one who is murdered. This is clear in the whole Torah, in the whole Pentateuch. So uh, this would make sense in the context of the Pentateuch to understand it that way. Another possibility that he mentions uh, is the Nephilim and Genesis 6 verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old men of renown. Well, this uh, discussion uh, has been raised in terms of whether these Nephilim might be these pre-Adamic uh, people, these people outside the garden before Adam. And uh, uh, this has been uh, a problem because the Nephilim are referred to in Numbers 13 when they go into the land and they find these, uh, the spies find these people who are, they're like grasshoppers in their eyes. Uh, and so uh, this same term is used and there's other passages that are related to this discussion as well. All these things are discussed in the paper. I'm just kind of reviewing a few of the things that I mentioned in the paper. Ezekiel is interesting in this regard, talking about the Egyptian soldiers that, that fall, but they do not lie with the fallen, Nophilim. It's the same word as Nephilim, uh, but in a different pointing, warriors of old who went down to the realm of the dead with their weapons of war. So these are viewed in Ezekiel as warriors of old, their swords placed under their heads and their shields resting on their bones. These and other things make me question whether we have such hints in the Bible. Uh, and this becomes uh, an ongoing discussion that um, I realize that some scholars have suggested that these are possible hints at uh, people outside the garden before Adam and Eve. Uh, I'm skeptical of, of that conclusion uh, based upon just the reading of the text, but I know that others push back on that and suggest that might be a possibility. There's a lot of room to be uncertain here. So what I'm saying is that that's uh, part of what I think I needed to interact with as I was reading uh, Josh is a very interesting book. Now, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, when we come right down to it, um, there are some issues in actually reading the text that I want to highlight. He's raised the question about this genealogical Adam and Eve, as opposed to the genetic Adam and Eve discussion. Um, and they're two different things. And that has been truly helpful because the Bible is not talking genetically, it's talking genealogically. That's clear from how it continues with the genealogies from Genesis 5 all the way through, even into the New Testament. Genealogical life was important to them. They come out of tribal clan culture where even history is carried by genealogy. You don't have political history amongst them. It's, it's genealogical history. And I've written on that elsewhere. And that's referred to in the paper. 
What I want to move on to is this discussion about the observable world focus of the biblical text. He's raised this question of the observable world. I think he's done that rightly so, because what are they really looking at in their world when God is writing to them? What I'm suggesting is that when we impose genetic science on the biblical text, we force an illegitimate mismatch between the Bible and genetic science. The Bible simply is not talking about that and God was not intending to deal with it when he inspired the writing of the Bible. Instead, he was concerned about what the ancient Israelites could readily observe day by day with the naked eye. And we need to apply this observational perspective more fully and pervasively to our reading of the creation text. God is speaking in a simple way while not being simplistic. For example, one of the things that I talk about in this regard is the three-tiered universe. Um, this is known from the ancient Near East, but it's also, in my view, known in the Bible. And this is a common human phenomenon. Um, everybody, in this world who has ever lived has lived in a three-tiered universe, even in their own understanding of their universe. There is what is above us, there is what is below us, and then there's where we stand and live in between what is above us and below us. And this is just a part of our spatial location. And, and people have, have reflected this from the ancient Near East and on in today even the most sophisticated scientists, okay, are aware of this. And in fact, a lot of our sciences are based upon these levels of the universe from an observable point of view. That I think is, is very important. We can go on and we can talk about other things that are observable, okay? Uh, for example, then in chapter two, verse seven, the Lord God formed man, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of light man became a living being. Then 319 comes back, for dust you are, to dust you will return after the fall. Well, it's very clear that in their world and in our world, we can easily know that when a body dies, the flesh deteriorates into dust. They had family tombs. They would shove the bones aside and put somebody else there to deteriorate. The point is, that uh, this is readily observable all through history, ancient and modern. Okay, that's, I think, uh, another example of this. And I can't go through all the examples. Um, when talking about the relationship between a man and woman, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Well, this is readily observable, okay? Man is attracted to a woman as Adam himself responded to the woman presented to him, and he wants to become one with her. He wants to do life with her, and they naturally bear children, and all of this comes with it, and that binds it all together. So they become one flesh. These are observable realities, and the text functions on this level, okay? It's about everybody, ancient, what everybody ancient and modern can readily observe. Similarly, and you look into Genesis 3, I have this chart that I use in talking through Genesis 3, about the dynamics of the fall. Uh, and you can go through this narrative theology about deception and doubt, illegitimate desire, the actual act of sin, shame, fear, hiding, scrambling about trying to handle this somehow. They had obtained the knowledge of good and evil and they were never designed to have that. So they had absolutely no idea what to do with it and they became shameful, fearful, scrambling, blaming, all sorts of things. In response to this, God cursed their situation. He cursed the serpent, which had effects on the woman. He cursed the ground that had effects on the man and his family and so on. Now, anybody who lives in the world knows about these things. It's what happens in our fallen world. We know about people being deceived or doubting or having illegitimate desires, or breaking the bounds of design and, and, and shame. We know these things. 
You don't have to be modern or ancient to know that these are realities. God is speaking on the level of human reality. This is very important to keep in mind. And it has to be applied pervasively to the reading of the biblical text. It can't just be touched on here when we think that, well, there's an appearance of age here or whatever, things like that. Okay, it's, it's something that's pervasive through the text. This is the kind of theology God was interested in doing in the text. He was interested in theology that explains our situation. And he, it's, he, he uses it as a foundation for the entire meta-narrative meta of scripture, the meta-narrative that explains all our personal narratives. So this is, I think, basic to everything that we talk about in this regard. Now, in Genesis 4, come to the end of this first unit of Toledot in Genesis, and at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. The only answer ever given to this dilemma in which we find ourselves is to call on the name of the Lord. It's the only one. And this keeps coming through as a theme throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament into the New Testament, the call to call on the name of the Lord. That's the practical outcome of our situation. The only thing that really makes a difference is calling on the name of the Lord. So in a sense, we have the whole Bible in Genesis 1 through 4 in terms of its effect. Now, I'm going to stop here soon, but I want to finish by... Uh, just highlighting, we have plenty of background for this three-tiered universe from the Ugaritic Baal myth, where the daughters of Baal are light, and then water and rains, and then earth. Three-tiered universe. There's multiple ways this comes across in Mesopotamian materials, and sometimes in multiplied ways. It comes across in the uh, New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament in terms of three sets of three days. First you get the, the forming and then the, the filling. It's a redo of the three days to create six, seven pattern, which is then a pattern for how they should live in Israel. Okay, work six days, rest on the seven. All of this is done with the idea of impacting them how they live in ancient Israel and how we live in the world today. So there's a lot uh, more that I could go through here that's in the paper. I talk about the image and likeness and the Telfeharia inscription about image and likeness being the statue. And I think that image and likeness at foundation has to be anchored to the fact that we are God's living statue here in this world here to represent him like a statue represents a king or a deity somewhere else. The idea is that we are a living statue. This image and likeness, though, can be expanded upon in terms of capacities, behavioral and otherwise. And so uh, I would say uh, that's important, but also in terms of character, the way it's used in the Bible, our character traits. Colossians 3, whole passage about taking off and putting on character traits in which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Image and likeness has to do with our character, too. And so there's a lot that's going on according to this in the text. Modern science has increased our powers of observation so that as uh, we, we have gone on in modern science, you get the, 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 the telescope so you can see the macro level of the world. You get the microscope that can, the micro level. I think we might be in a micro revolution now, something like the macro revolution in the in the uh, Copernican revolution. So at any rate, God never intended to engage directly with this level of observation in the Bible. He gave us stories that carry the truth of what all people can engage with in regular daily life. And with it, he, and with it, he intended and still intends to call us to fulfill his design for us and our world as his vice regents here. He does not accommodate to our misunderstandings and falsehoods. And that's another part of, of the paper. The Bible applies as it is. And these ancient Near Eastern contextual things are important for backdrop. We need to not make them the foreground of the picture. The foreground of the picture is clear to everybody in every age if we simply read the text as it stands. So I will stop there.